Hello! Today I'm taking a short look at Final Fantasy, and in light of the Final Fantasy Pixel remasters, looking particularly at the older titles with regards to appeal, posterity, and general enjoyment in today's times. And this is something that's interested me for a long time with historic games in general, but particularly with Final Fantasy, which is such a long-running and vastly different set of games today from when it was first published back in 1987, and yet it has been consistently revisited, remastered, and, and popularised by Square over the years, with the most recent effort being the aforementioned Pixel remasters. Now, Final Fantasy enthusiasts tend to be divided on these sorts of endeavours, and on the one hand, we have fans who love to see early titles restored that would otherwise be lost to time, and given this renewed attention, while others see the frequent ports and remasters as lazily done, or at least periodic cash grabs churned out by Square, knowing that they can generate a profit from their flagship series uh, at a rel relatively low cost. An additional component of this topic is the debate between remasters versus remakes, and some feel that if you're going to put time and energy into revisiting these older titles, then you should go all out and remake them to today's standards, which, depending on who you ask, ranges simply from audio graphic overhauls all the way through to modernised combat systems, voice acting, uh, to the standard that we see in the Final Fantasy VII Remake, for example. And finally, there's a question around expectations and price points, and the eternal debate of whether to buy at release or wait for a sale, is a decision of economy that affects all gamers, but particularly when we look at remasters, because after all, how do you price a retouched game from the late 80s or early 90s? You know, what are we willing to pay as fans, and, and what can or should we reasonably expect uh, from such a purchase? So, jumping right in, the question of whether old Final Fantasies are worth playing is an interesting one. And ultimately, yes, it boils down to personal preferences, and perhaps it's a contentiously framed question. But breaking it down, let's firstly consider the trajectory of Final Fantasy since 1987, and how the expectations we might reasonably have of the series today are the adverse of the design and structure of these earliest installments. And I mean this not just in terms of gameplay mechanics, which have always been experimental, but broadly reside in a character-levelling, turn-based JRPG format, but more so by narrative structure and the increasingly emotive, character-driven sagas that we witness today. And while character and story is only one component of the games, it is certainly among their most appealing elements, and what rocketed the titles to success in the latter 1990s, with both Final Fantasy VI and Final Fantasy VII in particular, being milestones for lengthy, complex storytelling hinging around their character ensembles. So, looking back to titles such as Final Fantasies 1, 2 and 3, which had relatively sparse story, uh, and indeed excusing Final Fantasy 2, didn't feature named heroes with identities and personal stories, one can't help but wonder to what extent this would appeal to players who were initially drawn to the series by the intricacies of story and character, and complex individuals such as Cloud, Noctis, Squall, Zidane, and so on. And it seems that Square are at least to some extent concerned by this, uh, since they oversaw the development of, of the Final Fantasy III remake, which as the game's first Western release did feature amendments to its story, wherein the previously generic Light Warriors were given names and Light Touch personalities. So perhaps this is a decisive factor uh, that plays into the appeal of Final Fantasy for some fans, uh, and is something that's missing the further we go back into the series' chronology. But again, take this with a pinch of salt, and there is a degree of subjectivity here, because of course we have plenty of games and, and game players that don't care for predefined identities or protagonist story arcs. And looking at the foundations uh, of RPG gaming, whether it's Dragon Quest, Final Fantasy, Ultima, or Elder Scrolls, there are plenty of titles that leave the personal narrative 
uh, and indeed the moral scope and the quest approach up to player input and player interpretation and is something that roots back to you know the tabletop rpgs that preceded the modern games industry so there is that uh, and there's always going to be a contingent of gamers who are more into the gameplay and the grind aspects of jrpgs uh, over story which is that sort of dark souls mentality where the story and purpose can be abstract and interpretable and it's actually the challenge of beating a difficult game that is the primary driver uh, and reward uh, of playing in the first place uh, which i'm sure many final fantasy 3 fans will attest to but looking at the final fantasy of today and how its reputation has been built around story and characters which is evidenced in everything from game sales to cosplay events to fan art and fan fiction there is a definite departure and disconnect between the earliest titles uh, and the more modern ones you know, narratively speaking so that's an initial point that perhaps more so than gameplay or even graphics uh, which are a factor but i would say a lesser one uh, could influence some gamers uh, and i know plenty of people who have played from final fantasy 7 onwards who have no interest in returning to the earlier games or perhaps they've dipped into one of the earlier ports such as Final Fantasy Origins, uh, which was a port of FFs 1 and 2 for the PlayStation 1. And they simply found that it wasn't for them because it was such a narrative departure from their expectations, having played Final Fantasies 7, 8 and 9, for example. Now, moving on to the idea of posterity, I think this is something that is both interesting and important. And as video games have become more legitimately acknowledged as cultural artefacts, there is a concerted effort being made to chart chronologies and preserve histories through the medium uh, at, a, at an academic level, but also much like cinematic publishers like the Criterion Collection, the British Film Institute or Artificial Eye, an effort to upscale, remaster and restore classic titles for new generations of consumers you know, is at work here too. And personally speaking, as someone that loves history, uh, the history of games and technology, and, and particularly the evolution and history of the Final Fantasy games, this is a key reason why I keep collecting and cataloguing them. And like many fans, I tend to own versions of the same Final Fantasy games uh, across multiple, multiple platforms. And I find it beneficial to you know, own games on, on Steam, for example, because, you know, looking at modern televisions, I don't know if anyone's ever tried playing a PlayStation 1 or a PlayStation 2 on a 32-inch flat screen, but it's not very pretty. So for me, the posterity and the preservation aspect of it is quite important. So from a posterity angle, I think all the Final Fantasy games are worthwhile, uh, and anyone that's looked at the Pixel remasters so far can appreciate that they are undeniably beautiful restorations of the first few titles. And I think it was the guys on the Phoenix Edge podcast uh, who mentioned recently that the remastered soundtrack alone on these games makes them feel worthwhile, uh, which I'd certainly agree with. However, the Pixel remasters aside is another reality uh, that Square, like many historic developers, have had mixed fortunes with the preservation side of things, and it has infamously misplaced bits of source code for several popular titles including Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy IX, and most apparently, I think, with Final Fantasy VIII, which received mixed reviews upon its remastered release, since not much beyond character sprites had been noticeably upgraded. The same thing happened with the remaster of Final Fantasy VI, which had some glitchy tile sets and blurry character sprites when upscaled. And so issues like this sparked the debate of whether Square should have put more time and effort into replicating and redesigning the assets for the remasters, or indeed if the assets were unsalvageable uh, and they could only manage a half remastered game, if they shouldn't just remake the entire thing in similar fashion to Final Fantasy 3, Final Fantasy 4 uh, for the DS, or of course, you know, going massive with it, the, the Final Fantasy 7 remake, which on the one hand, of course, departs from the idea of preservation somewhat, but on the other, arguably breathes new life into these aging titles and creates a renewed and aesthetically pleasing game experience for a whole new generation. 
And personally speaking, since seeing uh, Hironobu Sakaguchi's Fantasian, which is a beautiful throwback JRPG uh, from Mistwalker, and also other titles such as Octopath Traveler, I couldn't help but picture games like Final Fantasy 1 and 2 being remodelled in this retro contemporary style, uh, which would of course depart from their top down traditional roots, but arguably, you know, it'd be a really refreshing um, experience to modernise. So, remasters versus remakes is a perpetual question that looms large over Final Fantasy, and like many, uh, I am by turns intrigued but also apprehensive about where these might go, uh, particularly as it seems like it's becoming a reality, or potentially so, as in recent years, several people at Square have been hinting that they could be remaking um, other Final Fantasy games in future. Now, beyond posterity, and again speaking for myself here, one thing I've found to be a huge boon for early Final Fantasy games being remastered and ported to modern devices, which I'd never anticipated, but it's how conducive they are to portable gaming. And while I'm someone that loves complex characters and stories in games, I think it's precisely because the earlier games are slightly sparser on story and complex character arcs that makes them so good for the age of mobile gaming and short-term entertainment while on the move or away from a home gaming setup. Also for those who are generally quite time poor, being able to dip into a game, level up for a bit or complete a quest in 15-20 minutes and then quit out of it without losing track of some important character twist is really quite appealing I think uh, and while I mean no discredit to those who might play and enjoy mobile games like Angry Birds or you know Match 3 games I think Final Fantasies 1, 2 and 3 in particular hit a great balance between purpose of progression uh, and short-term entertainment value. And the introduction of save points in the latter remasters is obviously a great enabler of this type of pick down, uh, pick up and put down sort of play. So there's a few observations on early Final Fantasies, uh, particularly the first three to five games which were more simplistic in many regards. Um, although I'd personally say Final Fantasy IV is where character and story really started picking up and getting more involved. But let me move on now and, and conclude on a final point, which is that around, you know, cost value uh, and, and the price that's often being asked for the remasters. Now, of course, value is subjective, uh, but when we're looking at res restorations of old games, it's difficult to know what's justified and permissible in terms of price. And again, returning to this conflict between fans who love restorations uh, and those who are slightly more cynical, there's the debate between the time and effort taken to go back through and, and rework all these titles and, and these game elements, and those that think that it's not necessarily a very taxing thing to do, and the price is marked up to sort of play on the nostalgia factors of, of existing fans um, and what they'd be willing to to pay to play these games. And looking at, at the six Final Fantasy Pixel remasters, so firstly you can purchase them bundled together at about $75 or 55 quid, and this feels like a bit of an ask for many fans, though it's prudent to note that they that the bundle does come with the soundtracks as well, uh, and as someone that's paid about 30 quid each for the CD collections of several Final Fantasy games, and I'm talking about the original MIDI sort of quality soundtracks, um, that bundle isn't too obscene for me in relative terms, because I am someone that really values sort of owning the soundtracks as well. But turning to the individually priced items, I think it's a little more debatable, and for example Final Fantasies 1 and 2 are being priced at about 9 quid or $12 each, uh, and the remaining four titles are priced significantly higher. And this again raises the question of whether it was more taxing labour-wise to remaster those remaining four titles, or is it simply because they are much more popular among gamers, and so Square's trying to sort of justify the price hike, you know, from, from that perspective. So that's interesting to note, uh, and I know price isn't the be-all and end-all, but it is a reality that we as consumers 
sort of had to look at and and again going back to titles that were released sort of 30 plus years ago um it does raise eyebrows for many so there we have it in light of the pixel remasters and the other remasters in recent years that have preceded them and sort of piqued my interest this was a broad look at some of the you know the pitfalls and the realities of old Final Fantasy games in today's market and what we as fans sort of appreciate about them but also kind of contend with in terms of, of price and expectation and of course the question around remasters versus remakes which is an ongoing discussion in various forums and online so those are my brief thoughts um, let me know yours in the comments uh, and if you enjoyed the episode and would like to support the channel uh, you can like and subscribe and also check out the link in the description 